The United States hasn't been this politically divided in a long time. The political polarization here has become so familiar and entrenched, it's easy to forget how it even came about. It's been a trend that began about 50 years ago, and it involves the media, social media, a fracturing of the middle class, and race relations. But what about the parties themselves? How have they furthered the divide? In this video, we're going to talk about how the Democrats have gone so far off the rails, it's created an even larger gap between the belief system and the agenda of our two major political parties. I had a very thought-provoking conversation with a doctor who has an interesting story. We discuss our new entitled generation, the lack of accountability, and how liberalism is infecting so many of our major cities. Here is that conversation. Okay, so right now I'm being joined by Dr. Frank Rosenblum. Uh, Frank, thanks for uh, calling me and getting in touch with me. We had a conversation, and uh, it's nice to finally get to, to meet you through video. Definitely. Thank you for having me on. So you were homeless once, um, mm -hmm. and you're now a doctor, and we can talk about your story. I think okay. people would be fascinated to hear about that. Sure. Um, you basically, you went from being uh, homeless as a teenager and then you put yourself through college and now you're a, a successful doctor. It's a great Correct. Story. All this happened many years ago, but yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but before we, we get to that part, I'm interested, you said, you've said a lot of fascinating things about the problem with homelessness hmm. um, in this country. Um, in the way that you see things, what are the problems... There's a lot uh, um, the problems with the way cities are handling the homeless problem. You you had mentioned how unfair that it was that um, the homeless people were able to kind of do whatever they they wished and 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 um, in the downtown areas and and how um, it was detrimental to the businesses in the area and that was like one point that you had made. Yeah, I mean it, it's absolutely horrible. There are a couple different uh, points involved in that. First of all, you don't see these homeless camps in areas where the politicians live, okay? Um, when you had that chomp or Chad zone or whatever it was in Seattle, as soon as those protesters started going out to the area where the mayor lived, that all was shut down because there's a double standard, okay? Um, you know, you've got, you've got uh, you know, immigrants being, being uh, flown into, into relatively Republican states. They're not going to Martha's Vineyard because that wouldn't be very good for the people who live in Martha's Vineyard. Um, so you, get, you, you have these liberal cities where they are um, enacting policies that are designed to bring people in. A couple of reasons. No, number one, because then if you get them to vote, even if they have no ID and if they're, they're needles all over the ground and, and they're on drugs, then who are they going to vote for? So you, you solidify the level of support in liberal cities by increasing the homelessness. And as a physician, I have had taken care of patients from the emergency department and they said, oh, I just moved here. And I said, well, that's great. Did you move here for a job or, or you know, in the, in the ER and in the hospital? Did you move here for a job? Oh, no, no, I'm homeless. Well, why did you move here? Well, friends of mine said it was a great place to live, you know. Um, so you've got people recommending, homeless people, recommending to other homeless people that they come to Portland, Seattle, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the unfairness there is that there are people who've worked their entire lives to build businesses. They've worked their entire lives to make a life for themselves. They've got houses. Now, some of these are working poor where they've got small houses. They don't make a lot of money, but they own their houses and people are camped on their doorstep. What about the rights of those people not to be infringed upon? Why are we concerned only with the rights of the homeless people? What about the rights of those business owners to continue to have their business and not have it destroyed? So we're talking about only the rights of those people who obviously and clearly don't believe that those rights come with any responsibilities. So looking at this historically, it is a disaster. And again, I look historically all the way back to the Minoan civilization, the Roman Republic, the Roman Empire, all the way back to the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, we need to we need to teach our kids history, not just history for the last five years or orange man bad. We've got to teach them the real history of the of the world and of societies so that this doesn't happen. 
Yeah. And there's no personable accountability for no. the homeless folks. They're not motivated to really change their lives. Now, a lot of them, and I don't know the exact numbers because it's really hard to know. Um, mm. I would guess at least two thirds are drug addiction and mental illness of the people mm. on the streets. And then there's that of that other third, you've got people that just want to just live like that. You've got people right. that are transitioning. Maybe they had some bad circumstances. They're living in their car or in an RV and they're trying to get better. But I'd say a majority of the people that are on the streets need more help than just financial support or a job. They, oh, they sure. Uh, and, I, I would totally being... agree with you. Yeah, I would totally agree with you, Nick. Um, I mean, the, the problem here is this. Let's just suppose tomorrow that I couldn't, I, you know, something happened. I lost my, I mean, actually I've retired, but I work part time still, but I retired as a director. Uh, but just imagine that tomorrow I, something happened financially. I lost my job. I have dozens and dozens. My wife and I have dozens and dozens of friends, our kids, et cetera. We would all work together and work it through. I wouldn't be out on the street. My kids wouldn't be out on the street. There has to be something wrong with a lot of these people to the extent that they have not developed human relationships enough that there are people who are concerned about them and will step in to prevent them from being on the street. You see what I mean? I mean, it's just where are the people who they've had relationships with for 20, 30, 40 years? And the reason is most of them are drug users. They have not been able to build good relationships, uh, et cetera. You see, they, what they do, it's like putting a curtain over a broken window. They're not concerned that the window is broken, but they want to appear concerned. So it's basically virtue signaling. So anyway, sorry to take so much time, but that's just an example of how ridiculous it is. I agree. Um, what would you do to try to help um, get the homeless problem fixed. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, stupid, but I, it, it's, it's probably a problem that's beyond my ability to reconcile it. Um, I, what, what I think we need is a, a concerted societal and governmental effort directed at helping people to become individually responsible, not directed toward getting them into certain cities to make sure that the voting base stays the same in perpetuity. Um, you know, I've been uh, I've been in a lot of different places. My wife took some and I took some trips. Um, you know, the 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 Republican cities, you've got some homeless people, but we drove through not, you know, Memphis, by the way, is is a Democrat city, but it's in a Republican state. We went to Nashville. We went to Knoxville. You see some homelessness, but for the most part, it's it it pales in comparison to Portland or Seattle or any of the you know liberal cities. Um, it, there's a very good reason. We used to have vagrancy laws. Okay, I mean, if you're sitting in your house and somebody decides to pitch a tent on your porch, are you going to kind of think about, well, I got to deal with this social issue and I got to call these people? You're going to call the police, hopefully, if you have police in your city anymore, and you're going to say there's somebody camping out on my and doesn't have a right to be here. Um, and, and hopefully they'll be removed. So if people realize that they are not going to be allowed to do this, but there are alternatives available to them that they can avail if they go through proper channels, and if that education is, I hate to say the word, liberally promoted, then they will end up not doing it. You can't do something that you will be stopped from doing. But that doesn't happen in Portland. That they're, they're, they only clear out those homeless camps when they're encroaching on wealthy people's areas. And so I would be considered one of those more wealthy people compared to, to the, the homeless people or the, say, you know, socioeconomically. Um, yet I think the worst thing in the world is for people to camp out on the doorsteps of, of homes of lower middle class people who've worked all their lives to to, to get a home, and then those people make them useless. Rich, wealthier people will always be able to prevent that. But the poor and the working poor have no power. And we need to give the poor, the working poor, the people who are the backbone of this country, we've got to give them the power, not the you know, big politicians like Nancy Pelosi, who has four different homes, each one worth about $20 million, and then says she's very concerned about the poor. So, you know, sorry to go on and on again, but no, it's fine. So I get you on almost all of it. I, I think there's an argument that people say, I hear it all the time in comments on my channel that um, they, they want to bring the homeless in so that they'll vote for them or 
you know, but I don't really. So Portland is such a big city, LA. There's no way that 15,000 extra votes are going to make the difference in any kind of real election. I don't think. Um, yeah. And, and, and I grant that to you. It, it probably won't. But there there was very clear evidence in Portland of people rounding up homeless people and bringing them to the polls um, in years past and in dropping off ballots to them in this past uh, presidential election. So it's not just it's not only that those people could make a difference or can't make a difference or could make a difference. It's the mindset that it sets up so that the difference is made over a period of time after years and years of socialization into this. So the, remember, liberals have always played the long game. I mean, if you look at the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, they didn't do it overnight. They didn't do it in, in a week or 10 days. They played the long game. You know, they they went almost guerrilla warfare over time until they were able to to have the first and then the second revolution. Liberals play the long game. Generally speaking, conservatives just think about, I got to go to work. I got to make some money. I'll give some money to charity. And I want to make sure I can pay for my kid's education. Liberals, however, decide, well, we'll take over the education system and then we'll show you. Um, and I mean, this is the difference between more conservative thinking and more uh, American liberalism isn't real liberalism anymore, but the, the, the Dems and the Republicans, this is the difference in way of thinking. They're crappy uh, uh, people on both sides. Don't get me wrong. I am not a Republican in the sense that, well, I, every single person who runs is a Republican I'm going to vote for. But I'm Republican in terms of the Republican platform of, you know, uh, uh, of values that they may or may not uphold. I remember Winston Churchill had a lot of good sayings, and he said, you know, that that um, uh, if you're not a if you're not a liberal at 20, you've got no heart. But if you're not a conservative at 40, you've got no brain. Well, basically, I think that what you know, this isn't something that's brand new. This is something that's been building up over a long period of time. And what we've developed is a uh, social welfare system that rewards people for uh, remaining um, uh, remaining dependent on the social welfare system. Um, we've, we don't have a social welfare system that does things that make sense. Like, for instance, uh, you've got a working mother. Let's see what we can do about paying for daycare, okay? We've got a social welfare system that says if you're a working mother and you're working and making money, you're not getting anything. So if you, uh, if you don't work, then you get welfare. Um, we've got, you know, Medicaid for the kids and Medicare for yourself and then all the welfare benefits that go with it. Um, so the whole system is structured in such a way as to promote dependence. Now, if, you know, if you promote dependence and people realize that the only way that they're going to continue getting whatever small amount scraps that they're getting is by supporting the people who believe in this perpetual dependence, you end up with multi-generational situations where people continue to vote on the liberal side because they're getting what they deem or what they think are benefits from this when in fact they're sentencing their children and their children's children to to perpetual dependence and poverty so i think what's happened is it's evolved to the point and i said this you know 20 or 30 years ago you get to the point where you can't go back because you it's so entrenched and there are so many people and then if you really reinforce that by saying we want to take as many illegal uh, Ill aliens. Now, look, my wife is an immigrant. Um, she was a, she was born in India. She came over here when she was 12 years old. I'm all for immigration. I, I'm for immigration of every color, every ethnicity, etc. But when you just have people pour over the borders and then you talk about, well, we might give them $450,000 if they were separated from their their parents for a while. And we don't rem remind people that that was a program started under President Obama, not under President uh, uh, Trump. Um, Obama started that. It, it's almost a, 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 a it, it's a cluster screw um, where where it just builds on top of each other. So that's that's what I believe is happening, and I think that history will bear that out. And I think we could look back to. Tiberius Gracchus and the Roman Republic, uh, back to uh, to uh, Julius Caesar, uh, who was a member of the Populare Party as opposed to the Optimate Party, who were the conservatives of the day. And Julius Caesar 
ended up as dictator. We can go back all through history, which our founding fathers did when they built this country and made this country, and they understood this. And we don't understand it now because our kids are not taught that in school, because what did the liberals do? They made sure that they were in charge of the education system. So anyway, I'm sorry to go on and on, but <laughs> there's so much to talk about. I, yeah. You know, I opened up a, a Dr. Rosenblum can of worms. I asked right, about a, one can of worms. I, Don't even hey, get no. I get you. And the dependence thing, I know that um, part of the problem, most of the problem, in my opinion, is um, the fact that they cater to the homeless people in, in the big cities. They give them all kinds of stuff. And oh, so yeah. they come there in droves. And then, you know, the, the city, um, it's a moneymaker for the nonprofits. I know the nonprofits are not doing their jobs. Uh, they get the overhead is a tremendous amount. Um, the city um, bends over backwards to, to make sure that the homeless people are taken care of um, by giving them free things. But then at the mm -hmm. same time, they, they are overlooking a lot of the other issues that are going on. But what, what happens is that we forget the history, the lessons of history. When you've got popular revolts where people are given stuff that they did not earn, you end up with degradation of society. Now, that doesn't mean I don't believe in helping the poor. Of course, I believe in helping the poor. Any decent society wants to help the poor. But how do we help them? Do we help them by throwing table scraps at them and continuing to keep them poor? Or do we help them by bringing them up to the table where we are? And the liberals help them by throwing scraps at them and then saying, look what we gave you. Now it's time to vote for us. And it's it's horrible. You know, I read something that you wrote where you called as a doctor, you said that you make a lot of analogies between the medical profession and what's going on in the world. Right. And you called in, in an op-ed, you called liberalism a cancer. Mm. Um, and I want to hear how you describe that and your thoughts behind that. So basically, uh, it's this. Um, you see uh, the situation in California. California is extremely unlivable. Um, California, for, for the wealthy, it's very livable. But for, for mo many people, it's very unlivable. Um, you've got drugs all over the street. You've got needles all over the place. You've got, you've got homeless people living in parks. You Kids can't go to the parks anymore. It, it's, just, it's just a horrible situation. And so what they do if you look at Texas, which, you know, maybe eight years ago was 60 percent conservative and 40 percent uh, liberal. And, and what's happened in Texas? Well, the people got fed up with California. They left California and they moved to Texas. They made Austin into almost a carbon copy of San Francisco. I mean, keep Austin weird. OK. And the homelessness problem in Austin has exploded. But the real thing that's happened is in the last presidential election, even though Texas went Republican, it did so only by, what, four or five points. So people move away from California, just like tumor cells move away from a tumor. The tumor cells jump into the lymph vessels or the, 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 the veins, the vasculature, and they go to a place where the tumor hasn't yet you know, uh, started. And it creates a whole new tumor. The tumor cells don't think, hey, maybe we're doing this wrong. We're killing our host. We're destroying this poor dude. They just keep spreading and, just, and having the same uh, uh, strategy that they had when they started the original tumor. So all I'm saying is, why don't these people have any introspection and say, hey, wait a minute, why is this place so crappy? Why do I feel I need to leave? Is there any way that I have something to do with this, that I've caused this? You know, but they don't. So I think there comes time in society, and you look at the, all the different societies we talked about, where in mature societies where people have a certain level of standard of living, people tend to become much more liberal, and that does end to the fall of those societies, whether they balkanize, whether there's a civil war, uh, whatever the case is, that's generally what happens. Yeah, that was, that was well put right, right there. Um... I'm curious, do you think more doctors are, are conservative or liberal, like if you were to across all the medical fields? I would say more doctors are liberal. And I think um, and and more more people who are PhDs are liberal. And the reason is because most of them 
are not students of history. Most of them never really were as interested in history as I was. Um, and they were brought up in an education system that was controlled by liberals. People want to feel as though they're perceived as progressive. And that's the big problem. But more, I, I think it's probably uh, two, to, two to one or, or, or even four to one, three or four to one in terms of docs who are liberal as opposed to conservative. Now you have an interesting story and, and, you know, some people like to, like to, um, preach, but they don't actually have any experience in mm. something. Now you mm. were homeless at one right. point and you, you, you held yourself accountable. You didn't rely on the government at all. Right. Um, you worked your way up from being homeless as a teenager and, um, put yourself through college and medical school. Can you tell, uh, folks that story? Cause I think it's really inspiring. And it kind sure, of sure. I mean, we had a, a breakup of, of a family. We had, we had, uh, we had, uh, other, other kids. I, I have a brother and a sister. They've had their own challenges and I won't get into that, uh, at this time, but, um, they, they were able to be uh, taken care of by relatives and I did not want to be in any foster care situation. So when the family broke apart, I was basically on the streets. And I went to a teacher of mine, a, a wonderful guy, and I said, look, this is a problem. I'm, I'm, I'm on the streets. I don't mind being on the streets. I've got a tent, and I, can, I, I got a good sleeping bag, um, and I can, I can live out there. But I want to try to prevent the school system from finding out about it, because if they found out about it, I'd immediately be out of school or in a foster home. So I lived, I, I, this is Buffalo, New York, so it's not a very warm place in the winter. And I lived about three or 400 yards behind the school in a field, um, which is now the north campus of the State University of New York at Buffalo. Back in those days, it was basically just woods. There was, you know, nothing there. They had started the campus, but I had dozen, I had acres and acres all to myself. Um, this particular teacher Help me out. Help me out in the sense that he he helped me to arrange that the school wouldn't find out that I was that I was a vagrant, basically. Yeah. But anyway, so I lived for about six months in a tent. And then I got I had two jobs after school. School would get done at, I think, three or three thirty or whatever it was. And I would go to my one of my two jobs and I had another job over the weekend. Um, and I slowly saved enough money that I was able to move into a motel room. And so I lived in a kind of a flea bag motel room called the Rip Van Winkle Motel. Um, and, you know, it was not a great place to live. The girl next door to me was murdered by the guy down the hall. So that's the kind of place that that I lived in. But despite all the drugs all over the place, despite all of the stuff going on, I never used any kind of drug. I always worked every single day of my life. And I started working from the age of nine years old when I had a paper route. So anyway, I, I continued to work. I, you know, took the SATs. I did nearly perfect SAT scores, got into university, got into medical school, and continued to put myself through, through all of that. I did not believe I had a right to, to palm off the government or to you know, to, to say that, oh, woe is me, I'm going to go get food stamps, or I'm going to go get this, or I'm going to go get that. It seemed to me that it was my responsibility to take care of myself. I had a, a uh, I went to a McDonald's every day, I had a, a hamburger and french fries for breakfast, and my dinner was a, they just had come out with a quarter pounder back then, it was a quarter pounder and french fries for dinner. That's what I ate for a year, and I couldn't afford anything else. Um, so, so basically, I feel that if you are oriented in the right way and you believe that you have a responsibility to care for yourself, that you can do it. To this day, I don't drink at all. I've never, never smoked. I've never drank. I never took drugs. And it was so anatomic to me that I never even took a sip of alcohol. And to this day, I don't drink even. And now my wife drinks wine and she's got to do it because she's been married to me for 38 years. <laughs> and I understand that. But I do not want any mind al mind altering stuff. So I think, can you do it? And I've known other people who have picked themselves up out of the gutter and have done just what I have done. But you don't hear about that. I've known people who have done that who are black, who are white, who are Hispanic, who had the same drive that I had. But this is vilified today. If you do that kind of thing, you're not looked upon by, you know, your compatriots or other people who are homeless or other people who are living in a, in a flea bag motel. You're not looked upon in a good way. 
And where did those values change? That's the question. Yeah, I, it's just so easy now to say, I know we need to have a social safety net, but the safety net is so wide and vast that, yep. you know, people don't really have to be held accountable. I mean, it, right. it, we've created, we, we've bred weak people yep. that aren't necessarily interested in standing up for themselves and, and trying hard. I mean, that's just like, yep. you know, they either give up too fast or they don't try at all. And yeah. That's, yep. you know, I, I am worried about our, our future. I, oh, I think definitely. the country's just the, the generation coming up behind us is weak mm. and, and narrow minded and mm. um, they're not tough like they used to be. And No, it, and the point is we're all human beings. We all bleed red. Stop with the identity politics. Stop with the promotion of perpetual dependence and let's make opportunity for people of goodwill who want that opportunity and let's help them along the way. And, and yeah. we, we do need a safety net. We don't need a trampoline. We should not have a trampoline. Well said, Dr. Rosenblum. Hey, everyone. So it's pretty clear by now that elected leaders aren't going to help you. If you don't like what you saw in this video, demanding change won't work. You're going to have to do it on your own. If you want to be safe and want your community to be a place where people want to live, you're going to have to clean the place up yourselves. You're going to have to work with your friends and neighbors to lower crime. Politicians clearly don't care as much anymore. It's up to us. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production. Are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. You can get my email in the description to find out how I can help you find your perfect relocation. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you on not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right, someone's a realtor now. Who wants to deal with a realtor they don't know when you can have me help you, right?